Okay, here we are talking about George Washington and Daniel Morgan and their very complicated relationship. Let's start with who they were. There were certainly commonalities between Washington and Morgan. They were contemporaries in age. George Washington was four years older. Uh, they were both Virginians. Washington, of course, was Tidewater, Virginia in the east. Daniel Morgan was Western Virginia. And really, that was probably one of the biggest divides between them and one of the reasons for tension. Um, and it was the, the complications in their relationship and the tension was a lot a class thing. Tidewater, Virginia were the aristocrats, Western Virginia were the, were the mountain guys, and that was felt by everyone. Both of them took the waters here in Berkeley Springs for their help. Morgan was especially plagued by sciatica, so he came repeatedly. Washington certainly came to spend vacation time here, and he does write about taking the waters and thinking that they might make a cure of him. They both represented our area politically at various times. George Washington represented us in the Virginia House of Burgesses at the beginning of his political career. Daniel Morgan represented us in Congress at the end of his. There's no evidence of this, but I think that my speculation is that it's these two things that uh, Morgan did, taking the waters here and there, representing us as our member of Congress, that influenced people in deciding to name the county after him when it was formed in 1820. Our county was formed from pieces of Berkeley and pieces of Hampshire, and of course, Berkeley was named after an English overlord. Hampshire was named after a location in uh, England. And I think that by 1820, the people here decided they wanted to be Americans. And so they picked a famous Revolutionary War general who had connections to Berkeley Springs. Just speculation. Um, both Washington and Morgan valued honor. This was a major thing for them. George Washington was a rules kind of guy. Of course, he was running a country and trying to build a country, so rules were important. Morgan really only cared about what it took to win the battle. And that also created tension between them. Washington was definitely the social superior. He had education. He never thought he had enough education. He wasn't Thomas Jefferson or James Madison, but he certainly had a lot more than Daniel Morgan. Uh, so he had education. He had the Lord who owned all of the land in this area as his mentor. He inherited land. He married a rich widow, and so in every way, he was Morgan's social superior. Daniel Morgan, on the other hand, was illiterate, but he taught himself how to read and write. He had no family to support him. He had endless courage. He earned his way in life with a strong body and a capacity, an amazing capacity, for making friends. He was basically a good old boy. One of his biographers, I think, describes him really aptly by saying he was an uncommon, common man. He liked socks, he liked flashy clothes, he liked rum, and he liked 
sprawling. He was basically a dandy in a frontier town. He lived in Winchester. Uh, Washington, of course, traveled through that area a lot. Daniel Morgan turned out to be, because of his innate qualities, a tactical genius. He was one of the greatest generals in American military history, and definitely the greatest general in the American Revolution. He basically won the two most crucial battles in the Revolution, Saratoga and Captains. He ultimately marched through and fought in 11 colonies, <laughs> 11 of the 13. George Washington, on the other hand, was the only man who could have made independence happen, who could have made America a country, but he wasn't that great a general. He was lucky. He had good generals around him. Morgan knew that his mere presence could bring more men to join the army, and he proved this over and over again. He could give courage to his soldiers, and he would, before a battle, he would walk through the camp, he would talk to all of these guys, he would be working to build them up. And he knew that by doing that, by giving them that courage, he could win crushing victories. And he did it over and over. Washington was worshipped, <laughs> just the way it was. So Daniel Morgan, in my estimation, was underappreciated then, and he's underappreciated now. He just didn't get the good press that Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett got, who did nothing as comparable to Daniel Morgan in making America what it is. I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking of adding a little subtitle to the museum here and calling it Home of the Underappreciated. Because we have Daniel Morgan, we have James Rumsey, who was the real inventor of the steamboat. We have David Hunter's brother, who was the greatest sketch artist and travel writer of the century. Even the waters here, which are so profound in their healing properties, are underappreciated. So that's what we're going to work at, to sort of elevate the underappreciated here, connected to Berkeley Spring. So now we know who they are. From the beginning, Always, 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 Daniel Morgan was a Washington guy. He was always a patriot. The British held him in incredibly high esteem and more than once tried to recruit him to change sides. And they offered, after he was released from uh, a British prison in like 1775, so very early in the war, they offered to make him a colonel if he would come and join the British side. He basically blew them off. There's a great story about a dinner that Horatio Gates had with the British he had just defeated in the, one of the battles of Saratoga, because that's what they did in the 18th century. After you beat somebody in a battle, you would have them to dinner. And when I was reading this, I sort of tried to imagine what it would be like to have Osama bin Laden for dinner. I didn't think it was ever going to work. But it definitely worked in the 18th century. So here's this dinner that Horatio Gates has, does not invite Daniel Morgan. So Morgan walks into the dinner because he had information he had to give to Gates and you know, talks to Gage and, and walks out. He was a very imposing looking guy, Morgan. He was like six feet and very well built. And the British, of course, called them the hunting shirt. 
morning in disguise with a hunting shirt in. So one of the British guests say, who was that guy? And they say, oh, that was Danny Morgan. And they all got up and followed him out of the room because they wanted to meet Daniel Morgan. He was famous for them because he just kept beating them in all the battles. But they wanted to meet Daniel Morgan. In, in 18, 1777, I've got to keep myself fixed here in the 18th century. In 1777, there was a possible conspiracy known in history as the Conway Cabal. And it was after, I mean, during, uh, um, Valley Forge, and there were a number of members of Congress and other generals who thought that Washington just wasn't doing a good enough job. And they wanted to kick him out and replace him with Horatio Gates. So Gates went to Morgan and said, you want to join up with us? And Morgan said, never mention that detestable subject to me again, for under no other man than Washington as commander in chief will I ever serve. He was a Washington guy. By 1778, Daniel Morgan held George Washington in increasingly holy awe, as had many of the officers in the army. For the rest of his life, he would find any reason he could to do George Washington a service, either personal or military. In 1781, this is at the end of the revolution, they're getting ready for the final battle uh, around Yorktown, and Washington puts out a call for the, uh, some of his generals to come back. At this time, Morgan was at home because he was not in good health. And he couldn't go. But he writes Washington, what I can only say is a man crush note. And he says, my peculiar fate that during the whole course of the war, I had never on any important event had the honor of serving particularly under your excellency. It is a misfortune I have ever sincerely lamented. There is nothing on earth would give more real pleasure than to have made this campaign under your excellency's eye, to have shared the danger and let add the glory to, which I am almost confident will be acquired. So this is the note he sent to Washington in 1781. Who could not love this guy? <laughs> so, but repeatedly, Morgan was confronted with, not that he would have ever phrased it this way, wanting Washington to show him the love. And repeatedly, Washington would fail to do it for a variety of reasons. There were repeated slights and injuries to Daniel Morgan's honor. Basically, Washington did not value Morgan's character and his reputation. He, you know, over the years, Washington showed he both appreciated Morgan's skills but disdained his roughness. He, and later I'll read you what he says later at a meeting about Morgan, um, none of which were really valid points, except that he did have bad sciatica that would repeatedly take him out of the action. So their, their connection to each other actually started during the French and Indian War. Washington was in charge of the Virginia militia. Morgan was part of the Virginia militia. He was on the Braddock campaign. Morgan was a wagoner. You know, and it's one of the parts of Morgan's character that's so interesting, I think, in helping contemporary people understand the kind of guy he was, 
a wagoner, what he did as a wagoner was transport stuff. He made his living doing that, and then his early days in the military, uh, under Braddock, were being a wagoner. And what a wagoner did in the late 18th century, it wasn't like he rode on top of a wagon like you see in the cowboy movies. They walked, they walked next to their oxen or next to their horses and led them. So first we first meet Daniel Morgan when he walked as a 15 year old from leaving home sometime in New Jersey, someplace in either New Jersey or Pennsylvania. He was never clear about it deliberately. He walked from there to Winchester. And then through all of his early years, he earned his living by walking back and forth and back and forth, uh, delivering goods, picking up goods, and then in the Braddock campaign, he was a wagoner. There's no indication that they ever actually met Washington and Morgan, but we can be pretty sure that Washington at least knew about Daniel Morgan because of the flogging. So, <laughs> you know, Morgan wasn't one to put up with a lot of the British attitude towards colonials in, uh, in these military settings. And so he witnessed a British officer mistreating one of the men in his unit, and basically Morgan went up and slapped the guy. Well, <laughs> it just wasn't the kind of thing one did <laughs> to a British officer when one was a roughneck colonial wagoner. So they sentenced Morgan to 500 lashes. And I want to tell you, <laughs> 500 lashes is serious. And it was really important how one took their flogging. Morgan never flinched. And later he would tell the story about how he counted the lashes and they only gave him 499. So he figured that King George owed him another lash, but he wasn't gonna go try and claim it. Needless to say, this kind of attitude and how he took this blogging and why he did, and the British officer actually came to Morgan and apologized to him afterwards, really made Morgan's reputation. Everybody on the Braddock campaign would have known about it, including George Washington. So in 1755, Morgan was a ranger, and those were sort of freelance militia guys. George Washington never really liked the Rangers because they didn't have very much discipline. <laughs> Washington was a disciplined type guy. In 1756, Daniel Morgan was attacked by Indians near in the vicinity of Fort Ashby or Fort Edwards in that area in what's today um, Hampshire, Monroe County, and suffered an incredibly grievous wound that he um, and basically, Daniel Morgan's time in the French and Indian War, he started out as a wagoner, he ended up as an officer, and that made a big difference for him when the revolution came around. So, 1775, George Washington has been selected by the Continental Congress to head off the Continental Army, and he's in Boston fighting those first battles against the British. He only had New England militia troops there. So he called for more militia. He definitely sent messages to his home state of Virginia and said, I need some militia. Daniel Morgan <laughs> heard the call as the head of a militia rifle company. All of his backwoods guys did rifles. And they did the famous beeline march where they left from Shepherdstown. And he marched his guys in 21 days 
Tub Boston from Shepherd's Mill. And they passed for the hunting shirt guys. This is the hunting <laughs> shirt guys with their rifles. So they walked through all these towns between Shepherdstown and Boston. And for a lot of these towns, it was the first time they had seen anything that was not their home militia. Here were national troops. <laughs> they looked like the hunting shirt guys. So Danny Morgan definitely carried the image. He gets to Boston. Um, Washington is thrilled that these are the first soldiers that arrived, were from his area of Virginia. He was thrilled for about five minutes because Morgan just wants to kill the British. So that's what he's doing. From the minute he arrives in Boston, he's out killing the British. And Washington was a little disturbed because he was worried they were wasting powder, gunpowder, which was in very uh, limited supply. And of course, he was concerned because they weren't very disciplined. And there were times when things got boring that they would be really happy fighting each other, not just the British. So the first correspondence we have between Washington and Danny Morgan was in 1775 when Washington agrees uh, with Benedict Arnold, who at that time was still on our side, another brilliant uh, military guy, and Morgan, they're gonna go to Quebec. They're gonna mar march to Canada, and they're going to liberate Canada and make it part of America. So they set off, and they walk, in the winter from Boston to Quebec through just trackless woods. So there's a dispute with Arnold over who's going to command this division of riflemen. The riflemen refuse to be commanded by anybody but Daniel Morgan. Arnold, being smart, says, okay, that's fine with me, let it happen. But Washington writes a rebuke to Daniel Morgan, saying, you have to obey Ray. Washington's trying to build an army. He's fighting the most incredible army in the world at that time with the British. So he's trying to build an army. Um, Daniel Morgan never needed another rebuke. In 1776, George Washington does send a recommendation and recommends Morgan, Captain Morgan, for promotion, recommends to Congress, saying he was just released from a British prison because Morgan had been taken captive in this march on Quebec, which was not successful, in great part because the powers that be didn't listen to Benedict Arnold and Daniel Morgan, who were ready to go take Quebec. And they wanted to wait and wait till somebody, one of the other generals arrived. And they could have probably taken Quebec, but nobody listened to them. Anyway, 1776, George Washington recommends Morgan for promotion, uh, but because he was just released from a British prison, and again, that lovely 18th century protocol was that you would release your prisoners, your officers particularly, um, but keep them on parole. So they could get released from prison, but they had to promise they weren't going to go fight against the British. <laughs> so Daniel Morgan's promotion had to be kept quiet so that the British wouldn't know. He was violating his parole, which was fine with Morgan. In 1777, George Washington sends all of his troops south except Morgan's rifle corps. He sends them to Albany to defeat Burgoyne. And he says, no corps is so likely to check their progress in proportion to numbers. I have great dependence on you. So here we are, two years after he reviews Morgan, won't recommend him for promotion. He's sending Morgan to go defeat General Burgoyne. 
In 70, later that year, Washington established the Provisional Rifle Corps with Morgan as its head. Morgan's rifles. So they were culturally and professionally a hodgepodge of people. These were no longer Daniel Morgan's guys in New York and Virginia. They were anybody who could basically use a rifle from anywhere in the militias. They gave to Morgan. They went out and tried to scour the countryside for rifles. It was a provisional corps. So these weren't even established army regiments. But Morgan's genius was that he could make them work as a single unit. And repeatedly, this is what Morgan could do. He could make people, he could make people into amazing army units. And he could use tactics that have never, are still being discovered as brilliant in contemporary times. So, the Rifle Corps disappeared by 1778 because enlistments were dropping. The crisis came in 1779 when George Washington turned this Rifle Corps into light infantry troops and did not give Daniel Morgan the command because Morgan didn't have the appropriate rank to be in command of a regiment. So, needless to say, Daniel Morgan felt somewhat passed over by not being given this command. So he goes to Washington, he asks for a pass to go to Philadelphia and submit his resignation to the Continental Congress. Washington was furious that he was leaving the army, but he gave him a letter that said, he, he's a very valuable officer who has rendered a series of important services and distinguished himself on several occasions. Morgan left the campaign, went to Congress, and resigned. He talked to them, he reminded them about his service in Maine, and Quebec and Saratoga, but this was just too great an injury to his honor. And it's really interesting that Washington was so upset about this, because this is exactly what Washington did after the Braddock campaign when he, they wouldn't admit him to the British Army, which is what Washington really wanted at the beginning of his career. He didn't want to be part of the militia. He didn't like the way the British treated the colonial militias, but he never made it. So Washington resigned from the militia for the same reason that Morgan did from the colonial army. So it was like, yeah, wait a minute here. So the next year, after 1779, Washington again disproved of Morgan being promoted. He wrote to the effect that Daniel Morgan should have never been dissatisfied with a superior officer getting a deserved command. Through it all, Daniel Morgan kept fighting. He would leave the war for periods of time because of his sciatica, but he always returned. Then 1780 to 81 was Calpen. South Carolina, which was the most perfect tactical battle and victory of the entire war. And Daniel Morgan won it. And he won it using tactics that nobody ever imagined. Um, he was basically, he basically invented guerrilla warfare. 200 years before it became widely used. So, after Calpens, the war was basically won. Everyone moved on. Morgan struggled to, to get home because through that whole battle, he was in excruciating pain from his sciatica. He would have to be taken off his horse. 
carried into his tent and lie there to regain enough strength to go back to the battle. So, at the end, so this is the end. The end of the Revolutionary War, America gets a constitution, the country's being organized, George Washington becomes president in 1789, and things got a lot better between Washington and Morgan. And you know, having spent all these years doing talks on George Washington as his favorite barmaid, I hate to think of the fact that Washington might have been jealous that <laughs> Morgan was a better general. But, you know, so things did get better. Morgan was a Federalist. He was always a Washington man. They agreed on support for commerce, for transportation improvements, and for finding a way west. And George Washington, once he was president, showed constant appreciation for Daniel Morgan as a soldier. In 1792, Washington was engaged in discussion over who would head the national army that he wanted to form. Now, in this case, George Washington did dismiss Daniel Morgan as a candidate. He, he cited as his reasons the certificate issue, which were all of these false claims that Daniel Morgan was buying up the certificates that soldiers got for fighting in the revolution that would allow them to go buy land. Basically, what Morgan was doing, he was indeed buying them up, but he was buying them up so they got the best price, so that speculators and crooked people weren't messing with his soldiers. So he was trying to do a good deed. But, you know, as always, no good deed goes unpunished. So Washington had this in his head, the PR that said, oh, Morgan was a speculator, and he was just trying to uh, exploit the soldiers. He claimed that Morgan was intemperate in the past, which was true, but it was in the past. It was while he was young. Once he was in the army and in charge, he was never drunk like several of Washington's generals were. He had health issues, that part was true, and he was illiterate, which was no longer true. Morgan taught himself how to read and write. Then came the Whiskey Rebellion, 1794. And Washington brings Morgan out of retirement. Morgan responds, and Washington sends him to Pittsburgh to deal with the rebels there. Daniel Morgan was given his old command of light troops, and it turns out that he became a highly effective military governor in western Pennsylvania, solving all of these problems, calming everybody down, and turned out to be way more subtle a person than George Washington ever. 1796, Morgan is in his first successful campaign for Congress. He lost the first one. This was his second campaign. And he went around his district and supported the Jay Treaty, which Washington had negotiated, which everybody hated. But Morgan was out there getting people to understand this was a good thing for America, and the Jay Treaty was passed, um, and Morgan was successfully elected to Congress. In 1799, George Washington was again working on, and by this point he was out of office as president, he was asked to form a national army. He calls on Daniel Morgan for recommendations of men, which Morgan sends to him. And in response, Washington sends a note of thanks and signs himself, with very great regard, your sincere friend and servant, which for Washington was effusive. Okay. 
So Morgan got his honor, his from Washington, and then of course Washington was gone. Daniel Morgan lived another three years. He passed in 1802. So, what about the medal? What is this about the medal? After the Battle of Cowpens in 17, it actually was like Christmas through New Year's, 1780 to 81, Daniel Morgan was issued a medal by Congress. He really wanted this medal. This was the ultimate for somebody like Morgan. It was a physical manifestation of his country's applause for his conduct. It was a material acknowledgement of how they valued him. He really wanted this medal. Hadn't come by 1782. So he writes Congress and says, Where's my medal? And they say, Oh, well, we've been really busy. We haven't had time to do this. Hadn't come by 1783. He writes Congress again, Where's my medal? Now, this was to be his gold medal. Congress says, Well, we just don't have the money to be out there printing gold medals. Morgan really wanted this medal. In 1790, now Washington's president, a heavy little package finally arrives for Morgan from, George, from President George Washington with a note that says, it was a pleasure at finally being able to send this. Where's my medal, George? It only took 10 years <laughs> to get here. But Morgan was happy. He had his medal. Interesting medal. <laughs> and some really strange pieces of it. So on the front side was the traditional use of an Indian maiden to represent America. Now you gotta ask yourself, <laughs> why? You know, you're killing all of the Indians and letting them off their land. Why would you use this on your medal? But that's where it was. There was an Indian woman putting a laurel wreath on the head of the winner of the medal. On the back side of the medal, is a depiction of Morgan on horseback leading his men in a bayonet charge. Another weird thing. Morgan was a rifleman. I guess they didn't know how to draw like this because this was, this was <laughs> done by the Paris Mint. And of course, in the famous Trumbull painting of the um, surrender of Burgoyne that hangs in the U.S. Capitol, where Morgan where this comes from, where Morgan in his hunting suit is front and center in that painting, holding a sword. It's like, I'm sure Daniel Morgan never held a sword. He was a rifleman, but <laughs> rifles just didn't work, I guess. So the family inherited this gold medal, and then after Morgan's death, it was stolen from a Pittsburgh bank and never recovered. In 1836, Congress passed a law that recast the medal and gave it to the Morgan family. So, Morgan got his medal. He lived an incredible life that he would have never imagined from his childhood that started with nothing. He ended up with everything he could have imagined a family, a mansion, land, one of the most honored generals in the revolution, and he did all of this on his own because of who he was. And had he not been who he was 
And had he not devoted his life to striving for accomplishment and honor, he could have ended up being a fancy dress brawler outside of Winchester. <laughs> so here they are, two of the most amazing characters of early American history, Daniel Morgan, George Washington, and both of them connected to us in Berkeley Square. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Just some. You can become a Daniel Morgan fan. <laughs> I will tell you that when I started doing the work for the Bicentennial, I had I knew nothing about Daniel Morgan. I knew that the county was named after him. I knew that I had gone with Tommy Swain to the dedication of the statue that they put up in Winchester. I knew nothing about him. I read three biographies, including a 19th century one written right after his death, and I'll tell you, oh, 19th century biographies were not easy reading. And then read a contemporary one done about two years ago, which was really wonderful. And by that point, and with the great stories about Daniel Morgan, I became a Daniel Morgan fangirl. <laughs> and there's a story I'm going to finish <laughs> with my favorite Daniel Morgan story, which convinced me very early on that Daniel Morgan was an Aries, even though his birth date is not known. So, Quebec, the famous battle for Quebec. So Morgan's guys are inside the wall at Quebec, he and his riflemen, through the doorway comes a British troop, I don't know, platoon. And the British officer points to Morgan and says, surrender your arms. And Morgan picks up his rifle and shoots him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my kind of guy. And of course, you know, what I, being a former movie theater owner, what I immediately <coughs> thought about is the great scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where um, Harrison Ford does exactly the same thing in this Eastern Bazaar, and there's some guy waving his you know, machetes around, and Harrison Ford pulls out his gun and shoots him. <laughs> yeah! And then I discovered that that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark was improvised. It was not written. So I can only assume that Harrison Ford was a Daniel Morgan fan. <laughs> <laughs> and so there we are with one of the, my favorite stories about Daniel Morgan. Okay. Lori, would you like to talk to folks about uh, our little uh, fundraising? Sure. Let me see if I can By flip way, this around. Yeah. Hey everyone. Um, I'm sorry, we're going to go back over here. This is Jeannie. She I'm is Jean Mosier, and I'm president of the Museum of the Berkeley Springs uh, and um, one of three people who are heading up the bicentennial of Morgan County, 1820. Um, and it turns out I've ended up being the bicentennial historian. Okay, Lord. Hi, my name is Lori Hansworth and I'm the director here at the museum. I want to thank Jeannie for coming in this afternoon to do this great lecture and invite all of you to join us here at the museum. As part of our bicentennial celebration, we have a fundraiser going on called 200 Envelopes. And we have 200 envelopes that we are trying to sell before the end of this year. The cost of the envelopes is whatever number you pick. So if your lucky number is 76, you can buy that for $76 and you will have 76 chances to win part of a pot of money at the end of the year. So we still have quite a few envelopes to sell. Uh, we've already sold 100, number 100, number 200, and a lot of others, but your lucky number may still be here. So be sure to swing by the museum any weekend between now and the end of November to take advantage of that.
Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you soon.